Chapter 34, The Saint Sommelier. I don't think I could read this chapter without a prop, and I found some French Provence lavender that I picked two years ago. It's dried, it's in a little kettle. It's still a little fragrant. So, here we go. Chapter 34, The Saint Sommelier. To begin his sense and sensibility rehab, the instructor brought a large leather handbag containing tiny cap vials, each an eighth ounce of clear liquid infused with a unique scent, a fragrance building block. She tied a black sash from a bedtime kimono around his eyes, dabbed a few drops from a vial into absorbent white paper and waved it under his nose. Inhale and describe for me what you imagine. We're walking together through a grove and you stretch for the largest grapefruit hanging from a limb beyond your reach. I lift you up and you pick it. You ask me to close my eyes and you peel a piece of rind. You squeeze under my nose, spraying me with microscopic droplets of mist. What are you smelling? Grapefruit peel. And what's the tasting term used to describe that? Citrus, he tentatively answered. Yes, that's it. I've noticed that recently in some white wines and in coffee, you're learning, you're learning quickly. In this way, through blind sense sampling, Jane taught Paul vial by vial to experience, identify and learn a mandala of aromas from tobacco to vanilla, jasmine to musk, pink peppercorn to vintage leather, distinguish cedar from oak, and recognize a cornucopia of fruit fragrances, including strawberries, apple, pear, cherries, currants, blackberries, and more. At JFK Airport, Paul bit into a pizza slice and was hit over the head with a bushel of green peppers and remembered the vial Jane waved under his nose and a young Cabernet Sauvignon he had tried. He became an expert taster for acetic acid and corked wines because so many of his older vintages had veered into that undesirable direction. I'm good at identifying bad wines, he tells friends at a restaurant when tasting a sample poured by the maitre d' because I've made so many. There were also unexpected joys, such as the time after pressing a new red wine he stuck his nose into the pumice of squeezed grape skins and detected subtle notes of chocolate. Yes, chocolate. Jane escorted Paul around the wine-tasting wheel, opening his mind to a fifth dimension of aromas that took shape, became alive, and had personalities. A world of scents perceived by few, a world Jane inhabited. She led him by the nose through a looking glass into this parallel world. For some inexplicable reason, the man who couldn't remember people's names or how to tie a slipknot recalled and named the scents. Paul's nose, impressive to a layperson, was only a novice compared to the capabilities of Master Jane, whose scent superpower was equivalent to that of X-Men and the Avengers. She was in a sensational league of her own. As for Jane, she was a willing instructor because she wanted to learn more about grape growing and the winemaking process, and adored the bottle of sunshine Paul sent that made dreary New York winter evenings bright. Moreover, she had a dog crush on Bluey. The next crush season, as Paul caressed the vines for first fermentation, when everything was as exciting as the very first time, he texted Jane, pre-dawn, as he prepared to punch down the cap. Nothing could be finer than the fragrance of fermenting grapes in the morning except for the scent of your lingering perfume. I'll make the coffee, she texted back, and I'll cook you an omelet and scrub the skillet. That evening, Jane posted this poem on her Facebook page. I want you in the morning. I miss you in the afternoon. After dinner, I savor your taste of my tongue. And in the morning, once again, I love you. As Paul read those words, he was hit with a wave of longing, then saw the final line, my coffee. So clever, he thought, she got me. He messaged her back in French to slightly encrypt his meaning. J'aime ma petite café noire. Then unable to stop himself, added in English, 
I love my coffee black, or better yet, espresso macchiato. Springtime in the vineyard was changed forever when Paul discovered the perfume of flowering grapes. He texted Jane a close-up photo of tiny blooming grape buds so she could virtually explore the perfumery he inhabited, suggesting, you must capture this enchanting scent in a fragrance. Jane was beginning to have as much influence over his thoughts as the vines. They met as often as the harvest. Sometimes after Paul attended a technology conference near New York, one Saturday, he picked her up in front of her loft and drove to the Cloisters, a museum at the northern tip of Manhattan designed as a feudal monastery with a collection of medieval art managed by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Jane was captivated by the Gothic archways and passages and entered her fifth dimension and conjured a tasting, pairing the garden's herbs with wine made in medieval style. Paul escorted her to a large exposition room with a tapestry covering an entire wall featuring a white unicorn, and Jane felt she had entered heaven. Paul pulled a bottle from his backpack and presented it to her, the clear glass unlabeled, so she could see the bubblegum color. Oh my God, she gasped. This wine, inspired by you, is worthy of pink unicorns, said Paul, of the blush she made from ripe Tempranillo grapes, and if this had been a marriage proposal, she would have accepted their friendship was sealed that moment, till death did they part. As for the wine, it was good. Of course, not all scents in the vineyard are pleasing. A section of Tempranillo developed sour rot. Grape clusters that look fine had turned to vinegar or worse on the inside. Paul, Sheila, and Bluey inspected every bunch and did all they could to remove any barrier cluster from the vines affected by acidic acid before harvest. And after two days of lifting, looking, lifting, touching, tasting, and smelling damaged, vinegary, sour grapes, he described the fragrance as that of an unwashed ass. That, dear Jane, I would willingly explore with you once, but after smelling 100 clusters of foul-smelling grapes, I've had enough. The paths of these two crossed often without colliding. Two celestial bodies with different orbits. She, a bright comet with a shapely tail, who came into view once a year, her aurora so brilliant, filling his eyes, his mind, his soul, until they met again like a pair of zodiac lovers who could only rendezvous once a year. Paul's nose was destroyed by Shiva in India, whereas Jane's was blessed by the gods, her nasal perceptions unworldly. She didn't have the credentials of a master sommelier, but her nose was as good as the master's and rivaled that of Bluey, whom she adored and followed on social media. Enchanted by a smell, enchanted by a spell when he licked her in New York, Jane couldn't resist Bluey's charms, some of which, she perceived, rubbed off on his human companion. Magic surrounded Jane. If she visited a winery, it won awards. If she stroked a horse's forehead, he became a unicorn. And when she released a new fragrance, it sold out immediately. Jane's parents were high school sweethearts from a North Carolina town along Tobacco Road with one traffic light. Her father, Jesse, the school's basketball star, a b-ball king of kings in a basketball state, her mother, Marilyn, a member of homecoming royalty, though not the queen, because election irregularities prevented a young woman of color being chosen at that time, at that place, would run her up a high enough honor for an uppity negress. Marilyn's father had made the transition from farmhand to handyman. Her grandfather, a sharecropper born at the turn of the last century. Her great-grandfather, born enslaved, skilled at carpentry and framing, largely self-taught, their home always in good repair. Her aunts and uncles obtained jobs in the area's tobacco factories and textile, textile mills. The South was on the rise. The Voting Rights Act had passed. The Great Society was underway, with Vietnam a thorn in the side. 
It was the dawning of the age of Aquarius, and the progressive spirit of the times. Jesse's parents had taught him the golden rule to love thy neighbor, and in the new era of better race relations to treat blacks with respect. But when his father found out his son was dating a black girl, that was too much, and, f and forbade Jesse to see her. There's nothing that drives a young couple closer than parents who try to separate them. The relationship went underground and grew stronger, defying all odds, continuing into their college years, where, away from their parents, they can meet more often and unchaperoned. Jesse grew up telling his father, Dad, someday I'm going to play in the NBA and buy you a Cadillac. As one of the state's best players, he was recruited by powerhouses, University of North Carolina, North Carolina State, and Duke. Jesse was born at Tar Heel, raised at Tar Heel, and with dreams of wearing the North Carolina blue jersey of the Heels, he committed to UNC. Maryland's parents insisted their children leave home the year they turned 18, and if they didn't go to college or find work, they could join the Army. Maryland attended North Carolina Central, a traditional black college located in Durham, a short drive from UNC's campus in Chapel Hill. Being on different campuses allowed Marilyn and Jesse to grow and mature independently, she to concentrate on her studies, he the latitude to date other women. He was the best lay on campus, and co-eds, inspired by this summer of love, threw themselves at him, under him, and on top of him. The star of UNC's Women's Gymnastics Club practiced acrobatic moves with Jesse behind closed doors that inspired dramatic tumbling routines and top honors in the ACC. Marilyn and Jesse's relationship was put on the stove's back burning, burner, slowly simmering. So when the time came after graduation to choose between jumping into the fire or the skillet, Marilyn, full of self-confidence, chose neither and simply moved the soup to the front burner and turned up the heat. She was the chef of this kitchen, not a dish of meat on a plate. Jesse joined the Tar Heels before Carolina's basketball coach became the legendary Dean Smith. Coach Smith struggled his early seasons, with alumni hanging him in effigy after he started with several poor seasons. Strange fruit hanging from the rim. Ironically, Duke's coach K almost fired, was almost fired as well after losing seasons his first few years. Don't you love it when greatness rises from defeat? Smith not a flamboyant coach, instilled traditional values to his student athletes. His team's graduation rate was over 90%. Smith played a key role integrating the team, recruiting Charlie Scott, the school's first African-American scholarship player in 1967, a year before Jesse joined. Scott turned out to be an outstanding player, receiving several honors during his career, including second team All-American, induction into the College Basketball Hall of Fame, and the ACC Conference's 1970 Athlete of the Year. After graduating, he enjoyed an all-star career in the NBA. Jesse joined the rising tide of Carolina basketball in 1968 as Smith's team began gaining the wins that would earn him recognition as one of the nation's all-time great coaches. In fact, Jesse boastfully jested, he's the one who, coached, who made Coach great by taking the team to the Final Four championships his freshman year, a feat as hard as climb, climbing Mount Everest or planting a vineyard. The country boy from the one traffic light town done good his first year. He became so close with his black basketball brother. Some fans wondered if there was something going on when they embraced on court. What was going on was the bonding that occurs under immense physical and mental pressure in the trenches of battle or athletic competition. Those were interesting, volatile times to be a student at UNC. The basketball team's ascension coincided with increased activism of the black student movement and student opposition to the Vietnam War. When the BSM was founded on UNC's campus, Charlie Scott attended one of the first rallies during the winter of 1969 and spoke in support of the group. And with Jesse in attendance backing up his basketball brother, 
during the strike by UNC's African-American food workers to pressure university administrators to raise wages for cafeteria employees, Jesse invited Marilyn to join him for meals at the Soul Food Cafeteria, started as a funding source to support strikers. His senior year, Jesse willingly joined class boycotts against Vietnam. His classmates didn't recall seeing him in class his final spring semester, not so much to protest the war, but to earn money playing semi-pro basketball after his last college game. The 1970 season was disappointing, but in 1971, the Tar Heels won the National Invitation Tournament back when the NIT meant something. Off court, Marilyn could sometimes be seen on weekends by Jesse's side, he was her passport to frat parties on the 99% white campus that celebrated their basketball heroes as gods visiting from Mount Olympus. At one such party in the autumn of 1971, they walked outside to get fresh air, holding hands under the cover of darkness, but unable to escape the watchful eyes of a Confederate statue guarding the campus from a surprise attack from the north. The couple paused under the monument and embraced. What do you suppose Silent Sam would say if he could talk? Marilyn asked Jessie, displaying the inquisitive imagination that would be her daughter's hallmark. I don't know, but I, I didn't hear him fire his rifle as you approach. He only does that for white virgins. Eat your heart out, Sam, Jessie said as he bent down and slipped his tongue into her mouth. Thirty seconds later, he had worked her underpants down her legs, over her shoes, and performed the first ever backwards reverse dunk at UNC, leaping high into the air, spinning and depositing Marilyn's heart-patterned panties on the muzzle of Sam's rifle. The next day, they decided to walk back to the statue to see if their flag was hanging. They saw a crowd approach and didn't know if they were about to be arrested or beaten. Members of UNC's Black Student Movement and the Afro-American Society of Chapel Hill High School had joined forces to protest at the Confederate Monument the recent killings of two black men, one by a white motorcycle gang and the other by police. Imagine how many more lives they could have documented being unjustly snuffed out if they had had smartphones with cameras back then. Marilyn, who had developed a strong sense of social justice from her classes in Afro-American studies, fit right in with the crowd, and this time she was the passport that, that allowed Jesse to enter her world. His final year, 1972, the team made it all the way to the Final Four again, basketball's greatest stage and an appropriate climax to Jesse's Cinderella collegiate career. Jesse was drafted by the Houston Rockets and given a chance to play a supporting role on the NBA stage. His older Carolina teammate, Charlie Scott, drafted the year before, had married while in college, setting an example for, Jerry, for Jesse to marry young. And he tied the knot with Marilyn in the Big H, far away from both their parents, where the couple lived together in relative ease. They were married at a civil ceremony by a justice of the peace, and surprise, surprise, Jane was born nine months later, truly a love child. Was it tight jeans, two short basketball shorts, an overabundance of rupture-inducing extracurricular gymnastic positions, or bad luck that caused Jesse's to test testicular cancer? His mother called. How are you, son? I'm fine, Mom, he lied from his hospital bed, for if he told her he was ill, his parents would come down from Carolina to see him, and he didn't want to deal with his father and mother, at least not now. He had Marilyn by his side and their infant daughter as incentives to fight this. But he let it slip out, perhaps a primordial primordial desire of young adult children for their parents when under duress. He was in the hospital for tests, but don't worry, I'm fine, he lied again. A mother's intuition is as keen as a dog's nose, and she sensed something amiss and flew to Houston. 
When she arrived at, the, at his hospital room, Jesse was absent, and she was surprised to see a janitor in the room handling his clothes. She suspected the black orderly had gone through her boy's pockets to steal his wallet and confronted her. What, pray tell, are y'all doing here? I'm taking care of my husband. Lord have mercy, who are you? I'm Jesse's mother. What's that baby doing here? She's your granddaughter. Lord have mercy, exclaimed Jesse's mother a second time. The two women embraced, shed tears, and by the time Jesse returned to his room, reconciliation had begun. It's the mother with the power to heal a divided family, and Jesse's mom began the process with a call to her husband to share the news. Given the choice of a life separated from his grandchild or active participation, Jesse's father made peace with his son and Maryland and loved his biracial, 200% multicultural grandchild the moment he saw her. Living proof, people can change. Jesse survived cancer, but his basketball career was dead. Fortunately, Dean Smith encouraged his players to leave UNC with their degrees, although his classmates don't recall seeing Jesse in many classes. After Jesse's abrupt retirement from the Rockets, he was offered a headquarters position by a Houston-based oil company that appreciated his outgoing personality and ambition. With a good job and feeling comfortable in Houston, he and Maryland decided to stay instead of returning to North Carolina. Besides, there was soul food in Texas, and they were delighted to learn that carnitas, a featured dish of Mexican cuisine, was pulled pork barbecued, one of their favorite dishes, garnished with guacamole, cilantro, and onions. Since Jesse and Marilyn had grown up in, in a small semi-rural community, they purchased a home northwest of downtown Houston in an area of rice paddies and farms. What they didn't anticipate was the sprawling growth, and their neighborhood became, became suburban a benefit for Jane and her siblings, who grew up in Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District, one of Texas' finest. You could take the kid out of NASCAR country, but not, not NASCAR out of the kid, and with basketball out of the picture, Jesse spent more time fiddling with cars and had the space to do, to do so with a three-car garage and a large lot. That's when Jane, who observed and helped her father as best she could, became fascinated with the musty odor of old leather upholstery, the lingering scent of gasoline, and the mineral smell of oil. With as much passion as her father had for restoring stock cars and driving in demolition derbies, his daughter became a gearhead intrigued by scents in the garage, soon expanding her olfactory her olfactory interest to garden flowers, herbs, and the garden. Marilyn was a good cook who mastered the traditional southern dishes of her mother, including ham hogs, hog jaws, and black eyed peas, butter beans, and her fried chicken was legendary. The secret, Marilyn said about her chicken, don't overcook it, uh-uh. When young Jane wasn't assisting her father in the garage, she helped her mother cook, intrigued by her no introducing her nose and taste buds to more sensual delights. As the synthesis of two diametric cultures, Jane's exposure to different scents, taste and scents was wider than most. She was struck by the different scents between her grandparents' home, eventually developing the ability to discern the unique scent signature of every person she met. Marilyn and Jesse were well known in the neighborhood for their annual pit grilled pig picking that fostered integrated dining in the predominantly white neighborhood. The district schools were integrated, but Jane's school was overwhelmingly white. Her parents raised their daughter to be colorblind without prejudice, with Marilyn exposing Jane to as much black culture as possible so that she grew up bicultural, comfortable in both worlds, a human bridge between them. As a child, 
She never felt the racial hate her mother grew up with in small town North Carolina. After college, her visits to Dallas were a horse of a different color. Jane's appearance tilted towards her mother, evidence Marilyn used to prove unequivocally she was stronger than her husband. With milk chocolate skin and kinky locks, Marilyn affectionately braided into cornrows. Since Jane looked different than other neighborhood kids, her mother prepared her for entering school by telling her curious kids were going to touch her skin and her hair. It's your body. You tell them to ask permission before touching. If you feel uncomfortable, you may allow them to touch, never pull your hair and nowhere else, reminding her about private parts no one was allowed ever to touch. Coached by her mother, Jane expected expected the looks, glances, and stares, along with the request to touch her hair, and was comfortable in her skin. Frankly, she enjoyed the attention, with some of the neighborhood neighborhood's adults describing her as exotic. When Marilyn brought Jane to church uh, Sunday school the first time, dragging a reluctant Jesse with them, during the social hour, children in Jane's class recognized her mother but asked, Where's your dad? Over there, she pointed to the tallest man in the room, chatting with a group about cars and basketball. Daddy, she cried, running over and standing on his shoe tops as, she, as he waltzed her like a Frankenstein monster around the room. At a young age, children, innocent about most things except dismembering water bugs, Jane easily made friends, and when their parents learned her father played had once played for the Rockets. They didn't keep their children from playing or sleeping over at her house. And at church, as the years passed, Jane played Mary during the Christmas pageant. Parishioners proud of her as she acted with dignity and proud of themselves for being part of a progressive community that allowed a black Mary in their church. As for Jane's language, she grew up a native, native Southern speaker, learned Texan, Houston style, uh, and semi-fluent black, which she perfected in college, allowing her to fluently code switch in adulthood. Encouraged by her father, who set up a basketball court in the driveway, the athletic Jane grew up dribbling a basketball with her, with dribbling a basketball with her hands as much as Paul dribbled a soccer ball with his feet. She made the varsity team her first year in high school playing guard. Jane was only five feet eight inches and the runt of her father's litter, but because of her ball handling skills and uncanny ability to sink three-point shots, she was the team's second, uh, second leading scorer. With her pedigree, the basketball coach was counting on a state championship and with Jane gaining attention from college scouts, the coach made plans to, to ride on her success to a division one collegiate coaching position. And then, perhaps it was the physicality of basketball, smashing against the bodies of other adolescent young women, or a classic case of teenage rebellion to assert independence, or the encouragement of the track coach, who was a true mentor and didn't treat her as a ticket to promotion or not wanting to play in the shadow of her father, who maintained his basketball celebrity at UNC and worked as an occasional color commentator on CSPN. During each year's NCAA tournament, Jesse wore an oversized Carolina blue Tar Heel hat, larger than a Texan 10-gallon, displaying his trademark logo, GTHGDGTH, the Ackerman for Go to Hell Duke, go to hell, or perhaps it was the self-realization she wasn't that good and wanted to try something different that was more fun. In track, unlike basketball, the girls could grow their nails long and paint them as artistic murals to express themselves. Jane, along with other African-American sprinters on the girls' team, fashioned themselves after the 1988 Olympic gold medalist Florence Griffith Joyner. Elegant as a gel, swift as a young cheetah, long flowing hair tied as, a, tied as a fishtail, who cared if it slowed her down a nanosecond. She ran the second leg of the girls' 4x100 relay 
and reliably handed off the baton with a small lead. And her personal event was the 800 meter race, which required the speed of a cheetah and stamina of a donkey, more intestinal fortitude than the sprinters, to finish strong. During her last track meet in high school, she set a school record that lasted 10 years. Her parents, amazed, Jane accelerated the last 50 yards of the race. With good looks, colorful nails, and big hair, Jane wore wide con cornrows with a long fishtail. The major difference between Jane and Flojo was speed. Jane wasn't fast enough to qualify for a college scholarship in track. No matter, that wasn't her ambition. She ran her last track event at 17, but sustained a lifetime passion for running and personal fitness. As her father's girl, she loved sports, but was also interested in visual arts, expressing the vibrant colors and intricate designs of her nails. Her nose, fascinated by the fragrance of nail polish, a scent she should have taught Paul, who found the unmistakable odor of ethyl acetate from an experiment aging red wine vinegar in a barrel that veered in an unintended direction. Her father was a poor example of academic achievement, although he had his degree and expressed gratitude to Coach Smith each time they met at big games against arch-rival Duke and the Final Four. Wonderful opportunities to party with the Tar Heel Nation. Although Jesse nudged Jane towards UNC, Marilyn was more academically inclined, steered her towards historically black universities so that she could get in better touch with her African-American heritage, with Hampton, NCANT, Howard, and of course NC Central leading candidates within driving distance of their Carolina families. On a mother-daughter exploratory college road trip, they drove to each of the Carolina schools, and being so close to Chapel Hill, Marilyn wanted to stop by UNC's campus to see how it had changed and share some memories with her daughter. They parked along West Franklin Street, entering campus behind the Department of African American Studies, which Marilyn dutifully pointed out, and walked to the old well. Your father never drank from the fountain. That's why he was a poor student, she said. She told her daughter, who took a sip. From there, they walked through the green park towards town and came upon the guard of the north entrance. Sam, you still here? Marilyn asked the Confederate statue. The summer before Jane entered high school was time for the talk only her mother could have with their eldest child because of her roots and her family's experiences in North Carolina, which could easily happen in Texas. Her mother instructed Jane that whenever she came into contact with law enforcement, she must treat officers with the utmost respect and follow instructions exactly and slowly without any lip. She warned Jane she was likely to have such an encounter because when she got her driver's license and borrowed her father's car, there's nothing cops enjoy more than stopping a black girl driving a shiny, shiny big shiny Cadillac. It's just a statue, Mom, said Jane. What's the problem? Here was another teachable moment, and Marilyn told her about the monument's dedication ceremony when the largest donor, a white supremacist, bragged about whipping a Negro wench right over there by that building and how that woman could have been her family, was her family, and the statue contained that hatred within its soul. Don't you ever forget that woman's humiliation and pain running your blood. As they got in the car, Jane asked her mom to stop at Duke. What do you want to go there for? It's just a bunch of rich white kids. Look who's the bigot now. So they headed to Durham, with Marilyn waving to NC Central as they passed. They entered Duke's campus, parked at the admissions building, then walked along the road to the heart of campus, and there it was. The chapel, a tall Gothic structure towering over the community that cast a spell over Jane, as the vines did to Paul. And as she had grown up in a neighborhood of white kids, she was comfortable on campus and enchanted by the architecture. Marilyn was troubled. Her daughter would apply to Duke and be accepted, and what would her father, a Tar Heels Tar, have to say? It was seriously not a joke. Even the gregarious Jesse, 
friendly with everyone he met, though mellowing in middle age hated Duke with passion, especially spoiled, obnoxious Duke students, his most common spoken phrase, Duke sucks. Marilyn knew if she spoke against Duke, it would push her daughter to liking it more as an assertion of her growing independence. But she held an ace, and on the way back home, drove around Durham so Jane could get a sense of the college town, or lack thereof, at the time. Also, a stake pounded through the heart of NC Central. Two days later, they drove to Virginia and stopped at Hampton University. At that age, college-bound teenagers can instinctively tell in seconds if a campus clicks. What do you think? Marilyn asked. It's okay. Just okay. Geez, aren't we being picky? They continue the road trip north to Washington, D.C., a cosmopolitan international city capital of the free world with ornamental buildings, museums, coffee shops, and while you could argue for or against New York, Paris, London, Rome, Stockholm, and even San Diego for top honors as the world's best city, Washington would land on many people's top ten list. Durham did not, at least not on Jane's. She liked the city vibe and that of the nation's oldest black university, and became a Howard girl, studying at the center of the, of the world where she was bitten by the international bug and gravitated towards courses in international marketing in the School of Business, her major. She took core courses in accounting, operations, finance, and marketing, and with a long-term goal of working overseas, her junior year was accepted as an intern at General Motors, International Planning and Coordination Department. That summer in Detroit was a whole other world, but she fit right in because she was her daddy's gear girl and knew how to use a wrench and talk car. Her team liaised with Sweden Saab, 50% owned by GM. She visited Saab's headquarters in Sweden on business, exposing her to a smorgasbord of new tastes and smells, including lutefisk, reminding her of unwashed feet after removing gym socks, and the rotten fish that makes you throw up. The scent fascinated her. After her work in Sweden, her supervisor arranged for her to tour GM's European headquarters in Zurich, and she flew to Switzerland for a week. When she returned to Howard for her senior year, her life had been changed from tasting European life, and she was attracted to the financial rewards and perks of an international business career. Jane uh, Marilyn dreamed her children, with their bicultural background, would be agents for positive change and crusaders for justice. Although Jane joined Kappa Alpha Kappa sorority and, and service projects became ingrained in her DNA, in the go-go 90s, Jane's desire to pursue a business path brought her to the department to the placement office, not in search of an NGO or government entity to save the world, but a for-profit corporation. Her internship supervisor offered her a position at GM, and with that hand and with that bird in the hand, and a desire to deepen her GM experience, she was reluctant to sink other opportunities in the bush. So after graduating in May 1996, she headed back to Detroit to GM's corporate marketing department. Marketing is about influence, influencing consumer choices in a desired direction. In GM's case, creating the desire for consumers to purchase GM cars. Traditional tools include advertising, financial incentives, dealer incentives, and back in the day, advertising relied heavily on TV. Paul wondered how many vehicles GM sold sponsoring the Buick Golf Open Golf Tournament in San Diego, which he asked Jane the fourth time they met. Besides building great cars with unique features, what emotional factors, in addition to advertising, could influence the choice of one company's car versus another, Jane wondered. She recalled her tour of Mercedes factory outside Stuttgart that impressed her with detailed craftsmanship, including interior wood paneling similar to yachts she observed jogging along Washington, D.C.'s waterfront. She was also struck by the custom upholstery of high-end cars, and especially the fragrance of new leather triggering fond memories of her father's garage. In real estate, 
One of our tricks of the trade when organizing an open house is to bake a pie or cake in the kitchen and light scented candles in the master bedroom, knowing pleasant aromas enhance a potential buyer's first impressions. Why not apply the same tactic to car sales, Jane thought, as she started a skunk works project within GM's marketing department to develop scents that would result in a higher close rate at dealerships. There's the well-known phenomenon of new car smell, attractive to buyers. What if that could be captured and enhanced? It would be worth millions to the automaker who developed it. Jane had no formal Scentology training, but with a passion for the project, began learning as much as she could about fragrances and tinkered with creating scents at home. Although the project never produced a product scientifically proven to increase car sales, it did produce a passionate Scentologist with good business sense. So much so that when Jane was passed over for promotion, her ambitious inner voice told her up or out, and she took it as a sign to leave, and with financial support from her husband, opened a boutique scent salon in Detroit making a name for herself among the wives of Bloomfield Hills and Gross Point Shores. Jane's husband graduated with honors from the University of Michigan's law school and worked for GM's legal team. When he noticed her in an executive cafeteria, an executive, an executive cafeteria he pled his case and won. Impeccably dressed, handsome, articulate, he a Howard graduate a few years ahead of her, she relented to his rhetorical charm. With a sharp legal mind, he rarely lost an argument, closing all discussions with the last word. Effective in litigation, but not at home, where Jane desired to be heard, listened to, and nourished. When Detroit and her marriage began crumbling in 2008, she received an unexpected call from someone at a company she didn't know. You probably also never heard of this century-old family-owned Swiss-based Swiss firm, but you know its clients, for from a niche, possesses a vault of molecules that are its Fort Knox, the golden building blocks of fragrances. From a niche creates perfumes for some of the most famous perfumeries and designs fragrances for well-known consumer products, as it is for talented winemakers and brewers who start in a garage and whose reputation grows as customers increase. So it was with Jane, who had a customer with a friend at From an Each, gifted a creation from the Detroit Scent Bar, and Jane became a blip on the company's recruiting radar. As From an Each desired increasing its local American talent, they contacted Jane for an interview. For her, it was a baseball player's call up from the minor league to the majors, an incredible opportunity to pay for her passion and hone her craft on the world's largest sense stage. In the winter of 2009, shortly after Wall Street's flirtation with death, divorced without children, Jane made a fresh start in New York, beginning her apprenticeship with the Masters of Scent. From an each welcome women and men of all nationalities and colors, for their market was truly the world. With the city reeling from the harsh economic whipping, she found an affordable apartment to rent near Greenwich Village in the, in the Big Apple's core, giving her proximity to emerging trends in fashion, food, and drink. She wasn't alone when she landed in New York, for Howard had a strong and supportive alumni group and her parents took every opportunity they could to visit, especially when Carolina basketball played at Madison Square Garden, where Jesse had triumphed with the Tar Heels NIT championship team. Jane expected to be assigned to a master performer in Fermanich's Creative Development Center, but her first project was working with synthetic molecules to improve the aroma of a household insecticide. The next project, partially funded by the Gates Foundation, was to develop blocking receptors that made it easier for people in developing countries to use public latrines without being deterred by the smell. 
If a latrine didn't repel you with its pungent odor, you'd be more likely to use it instead of out in the open, a health hazard in the world's poorer communities. The Fermanage team successfully developed a formula to suppress the malodor. If Paul had known, he would have asked Jane to block the malodor as he experienced culling rotten sour grapes from his vineyard. During the day, Jane saved the world from falsome toilets. Evening, she tinkered at home on personal projects. One Saturday, she attended a wine tasting in the village with friends, and as the winemaker prepared to pour the first flight, he called out the person wearing perfume, the scent detracting from his wines. Of course, it was Jane who, who profoundly embarrassed, excused herself to the ladies' room to wash the fragrance from her arms and neck. Later that evening, alone in her apartment, she began asking, why does perfume detract from wine tasting? What if there were fragrances that complemented the wine to enhance the overall tasting experience? Winemakers pair wine with food to enhance the flavors of their fermented grapes. Why not pair perfume with wine? One of the most embarrassing moments of her life became the catalyst that launched a quest to develop, to develop wine-inspired scents sommeliers would welcome when tasting. Her supervisor at Fremenich liked her idea and encouraged her to pursue it on her personal time. But the company was interested in investing in her proposal. So Jane, much like a garagiste winemaker, crafted micro batches of wine inspired fragrances in her apartment. By the time she met Paul and Bluey during the Bootlegger's Express March on Wall Street, she had developed notes of Chardonnay, notes of Merlot, notes of Sauvignon Blanc. These Eau de Cologne didn't smell like Chardonnay or Merlot, but were designed with similar aromatic building blocks to complement those wines. For example, notes of Sauvignon Blanc included citrus, while notes of Merlot featured red currants, mission fig, and candied violet. She sold the wine-inspired fragrances at farmer's markets and to the, sisters, and to the sister network of Howard alumni, who became the city's most fragrant flowers, and was experimenting with Facebook to advertise her perfumes to women who liked Broadway shows and who liked Bloomingdale's. She wanted Paul's suggestions on how to introduce her perfumes to winery tasting rooms. As Jane explained her wine-inspired craft, Paul said it was a wonderful idea and encouraged her to pursue her dreams. Nothing could stop her from turning her hobby into a successful business, except staying at Fermentage, which consumed the time and energy she needed to devote to her business to bring it to the next level. If she wasn't ready to make the leap, perhaps she could hire an assistant to help grow her side hustle. Back in California, toiling in the vineyard, Paul daydreamed about this intriguing saint sommelier. Why is she divorced? Who would ever divorce her? Perhaps some people just don't get along. People would ask the same thing about him if he were divorced, so he wouldn't cast that stone. When he finally asked her why, she replied, her husband smelled. She's young, in her late 30s. She's not going to stay single long in New York. Forget her. Why are you talking this way? Okay, you could be friends. If I need a friend, I have Bluey. Not forever. We'll see. Does a city with a million eligible bachelors create a lonely environment because of its impersonal, always on your, on your guard attitude? Look at Carrie Ann, her solitude and serenity in the country. Jane, the solitude of the city. One inspired by vines, the other by perfume. Nature abhors a vacuum. How long can a single woman in the city remain alone? Maybe it's not nature. Maybe it's her choice. Jane's a kindred spirit, a soulmate. We could travel around the world together, build a business together, and the love we could make. She's a picture from Victoria's Secret catalog. Men will always ogle and tempt her away. Frailty, thy name is woman. But what if she chooses me? I'll be there for her, always, until she's gone. That won't be long. Look at your ages. When you're 70, she'll be 56. Isn't 70 the new 50? That's my age now. And she'll have so much vigor and sexual power when she's 56. This Viagra, does it work? 
She'll sap your strength and life force away if you make love every night. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> You'll be dead. And if I live? When I'm 80, she'll be 66. It would have been a great life together, and I'll release her, and she'll finish her days with someone else. Her clock is ticking. She wants kids. Your child-rearing days are over. So are Abraham's and Sarah's, and look what happened to them. If I'm destined to be the father of her children, so be it. She's black. Who cares? Get out of here. So, with lascivious thoughts in his head, Paul debated the merits and demerits of Jane, along with the other muses in his life, and whom he would choose as he worked the land with his hands, releasing his mind to adulterous adventures. As the May gray of spring turned a slow corner and the slow choke of and the slow track of life and the slow track of life into the June straightaway of the longest days, Paul, who had more daylight hours to spend in the vineyard composing odes to Jane that rushed from his head through his fingers faster than water through a dam broken by a downpour of wine to his stomach. He flooded her inbox with overflowing river of help for, help, heartfelt longing. As her midsummer birthday approached, the time of his greatest seasonal joy, his thoughts turned melancholic, because she was, as she grew closer to Paul in age, he was one step closer to the grave. He sighed with every poem, every story, every photo he sent, because with each changing season, it was another three months they didn't spend together, another season lost, and he wasn't getting any younger while she blossomed into the most fragrant rose in the vineyard, the perfect ripeness of womanhood. And should their relationship be consummated in the distant future? By then, he would be so old that the physical act of loving her could, like a spawned salmon, be his end. <sighs> he sighed again, and his desire and admiration found its way into the next audacious message he sent. She felt his longing, though traveled in different dreams, floating on clouds of perfume mist into the arms of a man as tall as her father, dark as her mother, who swathed his powerful arms around her. This wasn't Paul at all. Still, she was entertained by his quirkiness and pitied him. Why tell him to get lost when he gives me such mind-blowing wine? He was so adorable when he gave me that bottle under the unicorn. I almost kissed him there in front of everyone. And Bluey is so wonderful. She put up with him. Paul decided to decelerate his aging clock by exercising more, drinking less, and following a mostly vegetarian, pescatarian diet during the week, while grilling the paschal lamb on weekends, because, he said, the Bible says its roaming is pleasing to the Lord, and he observed for his hand it sure as hell pleased the Lord's dog, and tasted damn good, and he'd consume a half bottle of estate tempranillo. Petit Sirah or Merlatage to dissolve the fat in his gut and cholesterol collecting in his arteries, and after eating, work outside with his dog and muse about their muse. Bluey was inspired by Jane, too. Paul took better care of his body to prepare himself for her, for their highly imagined inevitable bonding. Someday, his time would come, their time would come, and he would be ready. Of course, if he had invested as much spiritual energy on his children and his wife, he would have reaped a more bountiful family life. There's nothing that either puts off a woman or endears her than one who opens their heart. And while Paul was embarrassed the day after at some messages he sent, he knew them to be a true expression of his soul, as honest as the expression of his wives. And he was grateful that Jane, who cringed at some of his lines, found the right diplomatic words to reply instead of ignoring or rebuking him. After a downpour of emotion, the storm in his soul gave way to clear skies, and he would go days, weeks, even months without contacting her, aware she had her own path to follow. One year, he gave her up for Lent, a greater sacrifice than foregoing chocolate, coffee, or wine. During those times, he enjoyed life among the vines, hills, and the companionship of his dog. 
By not cutting him off, Jane remained a lit candle in times of darkness, a muse who inspired him to make the best possible wine he could. Seasons passed without communication. Then she texted, I'm going to be in London next week. Want to join me? Is she serious? Paul wondered. What does she want from me? Is she crazy? Then it was his turn to respond diplomatically. I'll take a rain check on London. Please give my regards to Joe. But in four weeks, I'll be crisscrossing New York. If you're free that Saturday, let's meet for lunch. And meet, they did. The Bootleggers Express always delivers, and he carried his latest artwork, sharing with her the first fruits of her inspiration. This time, in addition to the bottle of love, he brought her a round, red, enchanted fruit that, when juiced, was the same bright color as a freshly, as freshly pressed Grenache. In fourth grade, the year Paul learned about Unipera in California's missions, his class also studied Greek mythology and the story of Hades, lord of the underworld, who kidnapped Persephone, daughter of Demeter. He offered his captive a pomegranate from which she ate six seeds, not knowing that for every seed she must spend a month in hell each year, which explains the seasons. For six months, the earth's mother, Demeter, weeps as her daughter departs to spend half a year with Hades, and the earth turns cold and barren. Upon Persephone's return, Demeter is pleased, and the earth blooms full of life. Paul plucked the plumpest pomegranate from his property, and with hope of seeing Jane more often, brought it to her with the promised bottle of wine. After returning to San Diego, he received this message. I just opened this magical wine. I can't believe it. Do you have any idea how special you make me feel? I'm blown away. I treasure your wine and your work and your words. I am honored and humbled by this bottle. The magic pomegranate surely manifests this good luck bottle. I can't wait to taste it. It's going to be a special ritual to taste. You are beyond amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Always, Jane. She texted a photo of the pomegranate drawn and quartered in the shape of a cross, perhaps to ward off evil spirits or spells. He texted back the story of Hades and Persephone, and that he, with only a casual relationship with the devil, would never keep her against her will, and that she had the power to decide the meaning of the enchanted seeds. Offering some suggestions, each could mean another meeting, another bottle of wine, even a kiss, whatever she wanted. The next morning, Paul woke to her message. I ate every single seed and feel the magic and power of each expanding within me. My God, thought Paul, is she pregnant?